On today's episode of Biblical Genetics, a fascinating phenomenon, something that happens when very old people have children in any population. It's something I call patriarchal drive. Now, that's a long phrase, but it's really easy to understand. It simply is the effects of the biblical patriarchs having children at old ages in the small post-flood population. It's actually going to have some profound influences and implications on what we think about human history. It's going to change a lot of things and answer some evolutionary expectations surprisingly easily. Now, what I'm about to say is based on an article that I published in a journal of creation a couple of years ago. It is now available on creation.com. Look in the show notes for the link simply called Patriarchal Drive in the Early Post-Flood Population. In the human species, males and females are different, obviously, but we're also different in the way that we develop. When a woman is pregnant with a girl, there's only about 22 cell divisions from fertilization to the point where the ovaries are finished and the egg cells are in the ovary and they're held in protective custody, sometimes for 45 years before ovulation. One of the reasons this is important is because every time a cell divides, there's more opportunity for mutations to occur. The DNA polymerases that copy DNA, they do make mistakes. They're amazing machines. They only make a mistake like every billion letters. That's, that's ingenious. But they have to copy about 6 billion letters. And in meiosis, they have to copy another 3 billion a couple steps. There's all these cell divisions that happen before eggs are ready. But then they stop dividing. No more mutations from DNA polymerases. Now, there are some problems that happen on the gross architectural scale. You can have breakages, you can have inversions, you can have uh, duplications, so that women are afraid of having children later in life because of a higher incidence of things like Down syndrome. This is true. But most of the mutation burden actually comes from the father. You see, it takes about 30-something cell divisions before the male's reproductive cells are ready to go. And then at puberty, they start to divide. And they keep dividing until the man dies. And every time those cells divide, more DNA mutations happen. More mutations are occurring and they build up and they build up and they build up to the point where, theoretically, older fathers should pass on more mutations than younger fathers. But we've also been able to document this experimentally. Older fathers do pass on more mutations. There's an increased mutation burden based on the age of the father to the child. Wow. So if you want to have kids, have them young. Now, I'm saying more mutations. There's not some giant difference. If you have 50 mutations versus 100 mutations, on a percent scale, that's almost nothing because there's 6 billion letters in your genome. A few extra here and there means nothing. But when we're looking at human family trees, and we're looking at like a phylogenetic tree of all the people, those branches on those trees have a certain number of mutations there, and they're countable. And the length of those branches, the evolutionist assumes, is based on the length of time that's occurred. But what if that's not true? What if at some stage in human history, very old people were having children? Well, then the length of branches is not dependent upon the amount of time. It's dependent upon the age of the parents. Ah, patriarchal drive. Now, I love modeling. I've written a lot of computer models. I've published a lot of my computer models in Journal of Creation and a few other places. I love taking a computer program and trying to mimic what happened in human history. It's really cool. But all models are limited. In fact, all models are wrong in some ways. But they're still useful and they're still interesting. So I've made a computer model where I can toggle in how old people are before they get married, how far apart children are, how old a woman is when she stops having children? Is a man allowed to have more than one wife? All these sorts of considerations that affect population growth, I can toggle into my computer program and mimic population growth over time. And so in an evolutionary scenario, I can say, okay, what's the mutation rate? Given the age of a parent, here's how many mutations I would expect. And since in evolutionary history, most people don't have children after the age of 40-ish, there's a pretty much constant mutation rate. But what if we put in biblical parameters? What if we say that Noah lived for 500 years before he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth? And Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the founders of the modern population. 
what would happen if that was true? Well, the answer is, each of the sons would be born with a lot of mutations that were not in Noah when he was born. In fact, Noah, because he was so old, he's the oldest father recorded in the Bible, by far. Because he was so old, he probably passed on more mutations to his sons than all the mutations that occurred between Adam and Noah. In fact, it might have been more mutations that ever occurred in the history of the world, depending upon the conditions, which we don't know much about. We don't know the mutation rates before the flood. We don't know the mutation rates right after the flood. We only know modern mutation rates. And modern mutation rates is a very interesting study in itself because the evolutionists who do these studies, they have to filter data. You can't just take two sequences and compare them. No, no, no. You have to say, well, we think there's an error rate associated with this data. And when we're talking about Y chromosomes specifically, the Y chromosome is 60 million letters long. And most of that is not considered. It's too variable. There's only 10.4 million letters in the Y chromosome that are used for evolutionary mutation rate estimates. The rest of it, they just get rid of. But even that 10.4 million, they still, they filter the data out. Well, we think that the error rate is this, therefore we're going to take out so many letters. So there's a lot of assumptions built into this. There's actually a lot of art inherent in this science. You can't just read a scientific paper and say, this is the mutation rate. Because if you could know that mutation rate, wow, you could run all the way back in time and say, how long would it take to build up all the mutations we see in the human population? But we actually can't know. But it's even worse when you put in patriarchal drive because you cannot know the early mutation rate if really old men and women are having children within a small population. So what I did was I created three different models, one with a linear mutation rate, one with an exponential mutation rate, because we only know the mutation accumulation for people within modern lifespans. Yeah, older fathers have more mutations than younger fathers. Okay, but we don't know anything about a 100-year-old father or a 200-year-old father or a 600-year-old father. So is it just like X number of mutations per year or does the rate start to accelerate as a father gets older? So what I did is I, I created three separate models and I ran each of them in my biblical model to see what would happen over time. And what I found was that indeed, not only did older fathers contribute more mutations, but early on in post-flood history, some years the average mutations gained is huge. I mean, in the order of you know 30 to 50, that's the average. So if, if a father has a, a child and he's a young father, that child only has a couple of mutations. But if an old man has a child, has a lot of mutations, the average is 30 sometimes, 30 new mutations. Today, you might expect 0.5. So early on, we have an accelerated mutation rate, a highly accelerated mutation rate. And if that we're talking about an average, that means that some of the fathers are pumping out children with a lot of mutations, while some are pumping out children with only a few. What that means is that the center branches of the tree are arbitrary. You cannot know that the length of that branch equals so many years because it might equal the length of the age of the father. Other interesting things that occur when you model things. I figured out that if you look at the number of generations removed from the patriarchs in the population over time, let's say like at year 1000, year 2000, year 3000, and year 4000. Well, by the time you start getting up there, there are some people that are the oldest child of the oldest child of the oldest child of the oldest child. And there are some people that are the youngest of the youngest of the youngest of the youngest. And so the number of mutations separating people later on in the model from the first people in the model means that at year like 2000, there are some people who are more mutations removed from the beginning than there are people at year 3000. Let me give you an example of this generational overlap. Right now, today, two grandsons of President John Tyler are still alive. John Tyler, he knew George Washington. He was born in the 1700s. He was president of the United States in the early 1800s. Two of his grandsons are still alive? Yeah, because he had children when he was a really old man. He had a second wife when he was an old man. And then his son also had a second wife as an old man. And two of the sons of that last marriage of that old man are still alive. So we go from someone born in the 1700s, his grandchildren are still alive today in the 2020s. That's nuts, but this happens and it's a really cool phenomenon. If those men today had children as really old men, their children would have a lot of mutations. Now it wouldn't make a 
difference now because there's 7 billion people in the world. But right after the flood, there was only six people. And even hundreds of years after the flood, there's only a few thousand people. And so these old patriarchs are having children in a small population. And in an exponentially growing population, you don't lose a lot of lineages. Today, you know, most people have one or two kids. Well, most of their family lines will go extinct after a couple of generations, specifically Y chromosomes or mitochondria. I mean, I have one son. My second cousin has one son. There's only two Carter males alive that I'm aware of from our great, great, great grandfather who came over from Ireland. So my Y chromosome is nearly extinct. I don't know if, if the next generation will be here anymore. In exponentially growing populations though, most lineages remain because if they didn't, the population wouldn't grow. So as it grows, those lineages are, are there. So if we look at the family tree, say the Y chromosome family tree, and we focus on the middle of the tree, the center point, the, the point where people are just starting to radiate, those big branches are quite possibly due to old men and old women. Cool. So forget about the molecular clock, forget about deep time, and take a fisheye approach to the phylogenetic tree. We probably have to shrink those center branches to make them shorter if we want to represent time. And the mutations are there. That is mutations. That is a mutation count. It is the number of letters that separate these people from each other. Taking the biblical idea that people lived a long time in the past contradicts the evolutionary assumption of a molecular clock and helps answer questions about evolutionary phylogenetic trees. The Bible can be trusted. We don't have to hide from it. We don't have to throw our faith away every time an evolutionist comes up with a new chart or figure or table. In fact, when we look at the number of mutations that separate men from each other today, we can actually use the evolutionary mutation rate and say, yeah, the Y chromosome atom of the world only lived a few thousand years ago. If you take away a lot of their data filtering, the Y chromosome atom of the world population lived very recently. And if you factor in patriarchal drive into this, it is easy to put Adam, in fact, we should be calling him Noah, it's Y chromosome Noah, it's easy to place Y chromosome Adam or Noah in the biblical time frame about 4,500 years ago.